have your costume ready. Uh, Liz and I was down with our grandson Joshua. And, uh, and if you need to see pictures, we've got about a thousand. So uh, <laughs> just stop us. Uh, one of our favorite things to do on the weekend now is to go see our little fella. And while we were there, uh, Liz pulled out some of the Halloween costumes that uh, that Joshua could wear. And I know that he could care less. And I know that he'll probably cry when we try to put them on, but it doesn't matter. He looks cute, right? So anyway, <laughs> as we look at those costumes uh, and thinking about Halloween, I thought about, you know, this morning we're talking about the devil, Satan himself. Have you seen those somewhat, be careful, somewhat flirtatious uh, costumes of the devil with the horns and the tail and, and all that sticking out? Now, Warren, don't you judge me. <laughs> Liz and I got one of those. And don't judge. She likes me to wear it every once in a while. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Halloween costumes. Sometimes people try to get them so realistic. Is it a real look? And we want to look at Satan himself. Is he real? 35% of believers believe that Satan is not really real, but he's a symbol of evil. So he's not really legit, not a actual person, wasn't, wasn't an actual angel one time, just a symbolic of evil. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 12 through 16 says this. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, and after you have done everything to stand, Stand firm, then, with the bell of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we study your word, as we look at words from none other than Jesus Christ in many of these situations, we need to determine the reality of Satan. And Father God, we pray that the Holy Spirit will move here to speak with us. And as we look at um, that, we, we know that we are the people of promises, the promises of the Bible. Father, as we take this to heart, Father, we pray that you'll move in an awesome, powerful way. Lord, we also pray for all of the deaths of those and the, the bad things that happened in that the synagogue. And Father, we pray for all those families. Father, what is this world coming to? People despising other people if there's a least bit of difference in them. Father, help us. Lord, I pray that I may decrease, that you may increase in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. We know that when God created the earth, it was perfect. Everything was perfect. Genesis 1.31 says this, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And the, there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. 
God saw all that he had made, and you could even say, and it was perfect. But then we find out what happened in uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? What happened between Genesis 1.31 and Genesis 3.1? God made perfection, perfection in the world. Then along comes this one that is the serpent. We know him as Satan and the devil. Something happened in between there. So what happened? Well, let's look at Ezekiel chapter 28. Verses 12 through 17. Son of man, take, take up lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, This is what the sovereign Lord said. You were the model of perfection. He's talking about none other than Satan here. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, ruby, topaz, emerald, chrysolite, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub. Satan was an angel. For so I obtained you, ordained you. You were on the holy man of God, you walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the man of God. I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you in, I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. How you have fallen from heaven, a morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to earth. You were once laid, laid, low, laid low of the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will set enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high but you are brought down to the grave to the depths of the pit Luke chapter 10 verse 18 he replied I saw Satan fall like lightning from Heaven. What happened between Genesis 1.31 and Genesis 3.1? Satan, an angel, perfection, made like that because of pride, decided, I'm going to be like God. I'm going to be a God. I'm going to be higher than the God. And he was cast to the earth. So we know that Satan is out. He's, he's been cast out of heaven but not our lives. Folks, the, the understanding that we're trying to, to grab here is that Satan is very, very real. He tries to destroy God's people on every turn that he can do. So let's look at this. What happened after Genesis 3.1? He was cast to earth, and 1 Peter 5.8, which is a very uh, familiar passage... 
First Peter five eight. Talks about Satan. Be self, be self-controlled, alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, folks, I think some of us can stand up and let me tell you, he's always there. He walks around. And let me tell you, you begin in your relationship with Christ to begin to fall away. Satan's right there to dive on you. Satan cannot. He cannot hurt God, but he can hurt God's children, and that's the most precious thing to God, you and I. And Satan can paralyze people. He walks around, and what a great illustration, like a roaring lion looking who he can devour. John chapter 10, 10. Probably one of my favorite verses, but sometimes including myself, may only quote some of it. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's what Satan does. Steal, kill, destroy. Nothing good in him. I have come that they may have life and have it to the fullest. I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly, the King James says. And sometimes when we quote John 10, 10, we don't quote the first part, we quote the second part. But the first part says this, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. So we know from what the Bible is telling us, and we'll look a little bit further, that Satan indeed is real. Matthew chapter 4. Let me pause for just a moment. Maybe some of you are thinking, Jerry, listen, you're just telling us stuff we already know. You don't have to try to convince me that Satan is real. Well, listen, folks, if we don't know our enemy and we don't fully comprehend his realness and how he truly seeks to destroy, he is not going to mess with you when you're on a spiritual high. It is when challenges of life come in that Satan, along with his demonic team, his demonic army, will attack you. And sometimes through TV and things like that, we look at it and we think, well, it's just sort of a, an imagery or something like that. Satan is so very real. We've got to understand that Satan is real. And, and when we do that, we're able also to do some powerful things through the power of God. We're able to do this, say, oh, I know that's of Satan. And we can know that he is greater than Satan. So Matthew chapter 4, 11, we're continuing with that look that Satan is real. He is so real that he was tempted. Jesus was tempted by Satan. Matthew 4, beginning verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days, 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live by bread alone, but only on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. Somewhat ironic because Satan was an angel. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus asked him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Then the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. We saw back in the Old Testament, that's exactly Satan's goal, to get the worship that God has given him. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. Then the devil left him, and the angels came 
had attended Jesus or attended him. Matthew 6, 13 is the Lord's Prayer. It says in verse 13, Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil world, the evil one. Satan is real. Now you say, listen, this is a series of messages that is on the people of promises. Uh, yes, that's true. So when you look at this, we know that Satan is powerful. He has the work of the demonic world that works against us and attacks us and in so many different ways. You say, well, that's not very uplifting. Well, understand that is who de the devil is, and he is strong and he is real. He's very real in our lives. But don't miss this. Satan is a defeated devil. He's defeated. Colossians 2, verse 15. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Through the cross, Satan is defeated. 2 Peter 2, 4. For God did not spare his angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood out of the ungodly people, but promised Noah a preacher of our righteousness and seven others. Uh, here we know that in all Satan is defeated. In, in the book of Revelations, he's finally cast into the lake of fire. Finally, at the end, it is done, it is over. The devil is defeated. Now, there was a story that Max Cicado tells in, in this book about a barn cat, or a barn that had a lot of cats, and there was the, uh, the mom of all those cats and kittens. And um, for those of you that have barns, you probably know about that. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, he said that the mom would go out and chase uh, a mice uh, or a mouse, would chase a mouse and would catch it. You know how a cat will do, catch it, let it go, then grab it again. And basically then would wear that mouse down. Then the mother, while the mouse was still alive, would drag it back, carry it back to her kittens. That way her kittens would know this is how you survive. This is your meal ticket. Uh, so the, the mouse was pretty wounded, uh, but they, she would let it down around the kittens, and the mouse, they said, would always rear back, show its yellow teeth, growl a little bit, whatever mouse does, I'm not sure if they growl or not. Get back with you on that. Somebody Google it a little bit. Um, but they said it would happen. The mouse knew or the mouse should have known, or everyone around would know that the mouse was defeated. Those kittens were going to get that mouse. It had already been injured. It was already down. But that mouse, I guess, figured I got one shot. Let me try to look like I'm bigger than my enemy. Listen, folks, we can't be like a mouse and try to think we're bigger than the enemy. We cannot handle Satan our own. Satan is real, but he is defeated. And if you mess with a defeated animal or an animal that is hurt, you better be ready for battle. The only thing I think of a worse battle is you bother a child and watch the mother come along. That's frightening, isn't it? I've seen that look. I mean, moms can be all calm and sweet and, and embroidering and, and doing things like that and making a cup of tea or some coffee, and you mess with their child, they're a wildcat. <laughs> and you don't want to be around them. Satan knows he is lost. He knows that God went out. He understands that. He knows the book. He knows the story. But he's going to fight 
with every tooth and nail, everything he can to make. And when things get tough, he's going to remind you that it's going to get tougher. And it's not going to work out. So we've got to, we've got to be alert of the devil, but we can't be intimidated by him. You've got to know he's there. 1 John 4.4 4 says this. 1 John 4, 4. Uh, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. The world can be so tough, and Satan, who is real, that has always attacked God's children, we have to understand that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen? Amen. Man, that's, we can't live defeated lives. We got to understand that God is greater. I'm not greater, but God is greater. And I call on God, and God, in this, it seems like overwhelming. It seems like it's too hard to handle. I don't know what I'm going to do. But I know that you're greater than any battle that lays before. 1 Corinthians 10 13. No temptation overtaking you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. You've got to understand, folks, temptation is coming from none other than Satan himself. Understand that. Be alert for the, the schemes of Satan and know what is coming, that it is of Satan, and call out. Cry out to God. Sometimes in temptation, we have to do a 911 prayer, don't we? God help me. <clears throat> Listen now. God knows, and you've heard me say this God knows your weakest area. He knows exactly what that is. I have a message that I preach, probably my favorite message that I haven't, uh, I've, I've done part of it here, but. Um, it's called a key in a contract. And the key is, first of all, saying, I'm giving everything in my life to God because this is the tendency that we may have if we're not careful. God, I'm giving you everything, but no, not that room in my life. That's mine. I'm not ready to give it over yet. And it's something I know I struggle with, and I understand that, and, and, and God, I'm just not, I'm not there yet. God, I want you, I want everything about you, but not that room. And I literally just ask people, will you give me the key today? Let me tell you this, if you have such a room, or you have a challenge, maybe you have given it to God, but you know what, those challenging areas come up again over and over again, don't they? Why does that happen? See? Satan's going to go up and say, hey, what about this room? Satan does that. That's a scheme. But one of the ways of victory, the only victory is through the power of God. We can't overcome a temptation by ourselves, but through God we can do it. And man, what a victory that is. But we can only do it through the power of God. But what makes it much easier is that when you're in tune with God and you know right away that is Satan himself. And you can turn your back and go on. Not easy. You can do it on your own power, but do it in God's power. James 4, 17. 4, 7. Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Maybe sometimes in your life you need to write that up and put it on every, um, every place that, that you turn too often. Maybe the mirror in the morning. Uh, I, I kid Liz, I, I just love mirrors. Just give me more mirrors. So just, it's, uh, <laughs> but sometimes, you know, you look in the mirror and make sure everything's all right. I try to see them don't look like an animal call up here and die or something. Try to get some kind of play. <laughs> Got one eyebrow and just sort of points this way all the time and just keeps going this way. <laughs> Place that verse so that you will know that listen, 
So we have the battle plan, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 and 4. What's the battle plan? We already know that it is not swords and knives and things like that that we can fight with. We know it's a higher power, it is Satan, it is the spiritual world, and it is a challenge to do that. But in 2 Corinthians... Chapter 10, verse 3 and 4, it says this. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war in the, as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they are divine power to demolish strongholds. You want weapons to defeat God. Here they are. Prayer. The first thing Satan wants to do, if you're beginning to get on his list to be attacked, prayer has stopped. Are greatly slowed down. I could see Satan now to his demon army get ready. Once drawing closer to us, their guard is beginning to come down. They're no longer praying. Worship. Folks, that don't mean just on Sunday mornings. That's worship God all week long. The Egyptians ever have just a worship of praise service at home sometimes? I hope so. That can happen a lot in Bible study. And then this, the other one is scripture, which is Bible study. Satan's not going to come up to you and say, hey, listen, today, why don't you do this? Why don't we go rob the bank here and there? He's like, hey, you're nuts. But Satan will begin to watch, and as you pull, if you're not careful, as, you, as the world just pulls you away from God, not that you're a bad person, but just pulls you away from God, Satan says, okay, guys, be ready. I'm seeing an opportunity. Certain victory. Romans chapter 16, verse 20. God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. That's probably just what the yeah, yeah, all right. The grace of your Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus, be with you. Guys, and that maybe happens some for ladies too. Have you re ever recorded a game, a football game, that you're gonna watch later? And then that blasted somebody at some point through a text or something gonna say, did you see that the that the Redskins won? <laughs> but then, do you sometimes do this? Do you go ahead and watch the game anyway? Because I tell you what, you can watch it stress free, can't you? You know your team's won, so you can sit back. And just watch it all unfold. Now what happens in football games, right? There's fumbles, right? And and the team will get down when they fumble. Sometimes the coach will throw things. There, different things will happen. Folks, there's fumbles in our lives. And it gets us down. And 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 we we know, man, I sometimes I messed up. I dropped the ball. Paying some high consequences for it. Later on, there's an interception in the game, and 
We have interceptions in life. Our defense, we think we built up a good defense, but the enemy scores on us. And sometimes when you're watching that game and you know your team's going to win, sometimes you see them really being sad because of what's happened. A field goal kicker misses a field goal. They're a strange group anyway, but nobody talks to them. But they usually go down the end of the bench. Or they're over at the, as, as they're all lined up on the side, they're over on the side and they're, their head's down. They don't know. Maybe I'll get booted from this team next week. And sometimes, folks, we go through life and we think we've got our defense up and we're all right, but the enemy wins and it's hurting and it's devastating. And you always sort of want to tell those people in the game, the kicker or whoever it is, you win. I know it's in the third quarter. I know it's in the fourth quarter. I know it looks down, but you win. I wish you knew what I know. I know you win. And at that moment, they didn't know. And folks, maybe today, maybe more than anything else, you need to hear the promises of God that greater is he that is in me, Jesus Christ, than he that is in the world that is Satan. Satan's real, but still greater is God. And maybe you simply need to hear today from Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit that he just comes to you right where you're at, right in whatever you're dealing with, and says to you, my child. don't know exactly how the game's going to be played out. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, God. I win. I need to hear that. I have family that needs to hear, friends that need to hear that. But today, the Holy Spirit is in your presence, sharing with you as God's children. You win. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your word. Father God, you are so awesome. And Lord, this game of life can be so difficult and so tough and, and so hard. And sometimes, Father, it looks like we're going to lose. We thank you for your word. That we win. Lord, today, maybe that's all the promise we need. We won't be so stressed out in the midst of the game. In Jesus' name I pray. Let's stand. We're going to have our invitation. I'll be standing at the